anyway, today's class. Hi, my name is Ken. I'm the owner of the Garden Center. Uh, today's class is on bugs. Technically, this, this is a, probably a short class. Uh, we've got certain bugs that show up every year. I'm going to share what those are. Um, and then I wrote a garden column just over a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. It's on all the bugs with pictures. I went through my gardens uh, this morning and went, i got to find a bug. I was finding that I sprayed my gardens uh, three days ago. And I'll share with what I sprayed. Um, I sprayed them because it's having grasshoppers and leaf hoppers. And I'm starting to see some damage. So I need to just get ahead of this. And uh, we were enjoying the backyard barbecue, and I didn't want mosquitoes and flies. So I was really spraying it for that. And while you got everything powered up, you might as well just spray everything else. And when I got down the next day, there was like there were carcasses. Happy there. I didn't even see it, but it couldn't. I was going, this is ripening. I shouldn't have waited on this. So I was looking for some of those today, but the lizard, the stink, the lizard with the, the colored tail, uh, they like dead things and go and they devour them all. So I couldn't find one. I did find this particular guy right here. Can you hear him singing right now? Yeah. This is cicadas. He doesn't even have a mouth part does no damage to your yard. They're kind of annoying. Sometimes they'll start, they sing all at once, kind of once they're singing. That's the males, of course, are loud and obnoxious. And they start singing in chorus, wooing the gals. Uh, they only live for a few days, and then they die. So they live their entire life cycle underground, five to seven years for this particular one. Cicadas in other parts of the country, they come up all at once, these we get some, just kind of every year we get some, but they live their life cycle basically underground, and they come up for one thing, to lay eggs, and that's it. And then they die and drop them down. This is so this guy's probably five, seven years old. He probably came up a month ago. Did his thing, and actually it's a he or she, this is a gal. She laid her eggs, and then uh, she died. So what will happen is, you'll see in the trunk, you'll see she actually has a, uh, her behind kind of burrows underneath the bark. I don't know how she does this. She leaves little chink, chink, chink marks underneath the bark, and that's where the eggs are laid. They hatch, they drop to the ground, and then they just live their entire life down there. That's kind of the life cycle. She doesn't even eat. There's no mouth on it at all. I can pass around if you want it, or I'll just I'll just leave it up here for you when you get all done. Um, these I tried to find. The grandkids came a couple weeks ago. These were just starting to drop. And when I gotta find some of these because we got grandsons, you know, boys and gross things kind of go together. Here going, oh, this is great. Well, I gotta find some more for me. I want to collect them. But okay, here we go. Um, right now, beetles are coming out. So beetles are the same way. Uh, beetles live their entire life cycle underground, typically anywhere from one to four years. It depends on the model. Uh, most of our insects that we have. They live either underground or under bark. We don't have as many because it's so dry, our climate is so dry, most of our issues are either underground or under the bark. We have more bark beetles, more tip borers, more things that eat the bark than other parts of the country because that's where the moisture is. We have a lot of things like grubs. We probably have 50 varieties of grubs. It's a white worm. Kind of usually C-shaped, uh, kind of an ugly looking thing. You get the big ones, you'll see this uh, big beetle, about this big with this rhino horn on the front of it. Uh, that particular larva or grub likes to live in horse manure. That's its favorite place. So if you're getting that free pile of horse manure out in Mayer or Chino Valley or Paulden, some of these places, we're, we're ranch country. We're in horse country. Uh, they give you that free manure pile. Be really careful, or you can spread this, you can spread these guys into your gardens. So kind of why you want to screen it or filter it or just check it before you just go. What takes care of that is composting. Heats the pile of manure up so it kills off the eggs and the grubs and that kind of stuff. But it's a great big grub about four or five inches long. People people will find it. We see it probably once a week. They put it in a jar. Some people. I just had a guy. He named them. And put him on his, he'd been on his uh, mantle for like a week, just sitting there looking at him because they were so funky, like, oh yeah, that's, that's a grub. That's, there's what it turns into. 
they're bad. You should take them home and kill them. Or barbecue them. Uh, they're big enough to barbecue, I think. They're huge. Uh, grubs live underground and they eat the roots of your plants. They're not good. You do want to deal with them. And if you see one grub, you've got a family of them. It's never just one. If you're, if you're just digging, planting some, some beans or a new tree or something, uh, they have been exceptionally bad this year. In fact, it's to the point where we just put grub killer on the trucks uh, when we're planting. If you buy a spruce or pine or whatever from us, we, we grow it, we'll plant it. The trucks are rolling around, they, we start digging. The last thing we want to do is plant a $500 spruce tree into a, a colony of grubs. Because the tree will be dead within a week, maybe a month at most. It just stresses out because the grubs just start going on it and eating the roots. So we'll taint, we'll, we'll kill that colony or that part of the garden off before we plant. They've gotten that bad. So each year it's something different. Right now I'm hearing what mayor you guys had, uh, um, I'm hearing this mayor doing that whole valley area all the way up. Grasshoppers are starting to show up like in biblical proportions. Not quite that bad. The ground isn't moving yet, but it will be. It'll, it can get that bad. So grasshoppers can be real serious. They seem to cycle every other year. There seems to be this I have no science on this, but it seems like this gets decades of doing this. Grasshoppers are bad one year, and the next year they're not as bad. They're not. They're still there, but there's not like, oh my gosh, there's no garden enough. The grasshoppers ate them all. Uh, if you don't get on them, they can literally level flower beds. They can get on everything. Um, the next year it seems like blister beetles come out. These clouds of uh, one-inch beetles. They're real narrow long and kind of cute they call them blister beetles because in the ranch country if you actually slap that and get their their essence on your on your skin it'll actually leave a welt if they get into hay and straw and things that your horses eat it can kill a horse because they just digest this and it eats their inside now so blister beetles are bad and they swarm they don't just they don't just they don't just show up onesie twosies they're very very social they like to land in a cloud and they'll, they'll get on an ash tree and they will be, the whole tree will be black and no foliage left. They'll strip it clean. They really like things like uh, the native uh, mimosas, chitalpas, desert willows, uh, Spanish brooms. There's certain things they really like, but something you should, I, I know they're out there and so I'm always ready. And by the time you see them in your gardens, by the time you get to the garden center and go back and get, get your spray and go back and get, get it all set up, they've stripped the gardens and left. You need to be ready for them when you see them. You need to be, something need to be, needs to be in the garden shed or in the garage, ready to take on that particular insect. Uh, the insects in summer are worse than in spring. Spring, we really only have two insects that bother us, aphids and thrip, T-H-R-I-P. We really don't have those out there in the gardens right now because they don't like heat. They can't handle the heat. They like that cool, they like bright days, very cold nights. Snow on them every once in a while, they'll really populate. And so aphids, they'll, call, they'll cause this, uh, we call it honeydew or, or aphid poo basically. It, it is shiny, a glossy, uh, the, the rocks and the foliage underneath where they've been eating, usually they'll be in the top of pine trees, that's their native thing they like to eat. They, they migrate over very easily to apples and aspens and willows, softer body things it seems like they go after. Uh, but you'll see this sheen underneath, and you won't see the bug. So people go, I got this problem, all my leaves look like they're wet. I'm going, yeah, it's aphids. Because no, it can't be aphids, I don't see anything. Going, it's aphids. <laughs> they're up in the tree, trust me, they're up there. They're up there. Uh, sometimes you'll park underneath the car and, and they'll be under, underneath the uh, the native Chinese elm trees will eat on those. You'll park underneath these big trees, and then your car is all spotted with with uh, sap and things. That's always aphids. That's what causes that. They're easy to kill. We'll show you how to kill things in a second. But right now, just letting you know what's on your. And again, these things. I'm going to, I'm going to send this to you. In fact, I should send this around. You've got samples of aphids. A picture. What they look like. You've got. Uh, bud worms, what they look like. I'm trying to describe them verbally because I can't find a sample in my yard. Usually I'll go out and find an issue. I couldn't find one. 
my gardens are that good right now. Actually, I'm sure I'll find, I just pray this is what's happening. So, what's that? Squash bugs. So beetles on squash or squash bugs. Beetles on cucumbers are cucumber bugs. Be beetles on, on elms are elm leaf skeletonizer. Bugs on grapes are grape leaf skeletonizer. There are certain insects, they really like certain kinds of plants. They're just like you and I. How many people like broccoli? How many people hate broccoli? Yeah, there, there you go. How many people love artichokes? Yeah, how many people hate I hate artichokes? Don't invite me over and give me an artichoke. I'll gag. I can't do it. Um, I grow artichoke because it's the most beautiful plant I've ever seen. The flower is blue. I don't I don't harvest the fruit. I just ugh. But the flower is beautiful. So I grow for that. Uh, leaf spot. You also have pictures of that because that's you're starting to see powdery mildew show up. A picture of powdery mildew, spider mites. You'll have this. Oh, tomato worms. So I covered everything in this. Dang, I'm good. Wow, okay. Anyway, this will be in your inbox, this article. It'll be actually, it's a link to, to the website. Uh, there's like thousands of articles on the website. Uh, this one was printed like last year. If you were to try to find it, it would take you forever. I'm just going to send you the link so you got a direct access to it. Does it make sense? So you put your email down, and we'll have that out to you right now. This afternoon, it'll be in your inbox, okay? So if you're, if you're a note taker, you, you'll have something that'll really make you happy here in a little bit. Okay, so covered grasshoppers are out there, blister beetles. Now we got cucumber and mint, um, squash bugs, uh, aphids and thrip in spring. Uh, coincidentally, aphids and thrip like, like cool weather, bright days, cool nights. Well, they, come, they become a problem in the spring and in the fall. You'll see them rebound in the fall. In fact, they could show up. The first rains, they start to show up. Am I staying in the picture? No, that's just my... You, you know, got six feet, your, man. You got six job. feet. Am I supposed to stay right here? <laughs> I, gotta, I better do this. I just feel like I should be right here. I'm attracted to her or something. Just, I wanna well, I can understand side. that, but wait till after the class. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll try a better class. Uh, okay, so um, what I'm seeing in my own gardens right now, there's a there's a little tiny caterpillar showing up. I love flowers. I'm a flower grower. I grow tomatoes. I'm a salsa grower too. But really, flowers are my thing. I love flowers. Geraniums, petunia. I mean, just if it's got color, fragrance, I'm in. And so I am finding some holes in my petunias, calabrachoas, geraniums are starting to. Um, the flower disappears. The plant looks fabulous, but the flowers are going away. That, there's only one thing that will do that. That's called budworm. Budworms are cause if you got a hole in your flowers, you need to be proactive on this. You need to get on it because they can strip the plant and have no flowers within days. It's called budworm. It's a real pretty little green in, uh, caterpillar. Um, it's related to the tomato worm, which gets like on steroids. I mean, tomato worms are huge green caterpillars on your tomatoes. Um, they can migrate over to peppers sometimes. They'll get on my jalapenos and things sometimes, but they seem to be like the vegetable garden. The adult stage of this is a tiny little white moth. It's insignificant. You can't even recognize it. The tomato worm. That one turns into, you'll see a, a moth that flies around that looks like a hummingbird. It has a real long proboscis, real long uh, it pollinates, flies around, you go, oh, hummingbird. That's not a hummingbird, that's a moth. That's a tomato worm. She's laying eggs on your tomatoes and stuff, and that's the larva stage, is that particular uh, tomato. Coincidentally, if they eat tobacco, that same exact bug, it turns blue instead of green. Garden trivia, there you go. Uh, what do you do? Uh, for my gardens, I have BT. This is all organic. You can spray it up to the day of harvest. You can actually spray your tomatoes, eat it the next day, be perfectly safe, and completely organic. Um, this is a really great product for caterpillars. It only works on caterpillars. It won't work on a grasshopper. The only way this will work on a grasshopper is if you take the bottle and beat it over the head. But the spray itself is not going to work. It's not going to take care of aphids or spider mites. It only works on caterpillars. 
but boy, to keep it organic and specific. And you know we're gonna have some caterpillar stuff. Uh, we get a caterpillar on grapes. Haven't seen it yet, I've got quite a few grapes, but I'm looking for it, because I know she's coming. It's a caterpillar, she'll lay her eggs, a little moth, lays her eggs, and it'll be a caterpillar about like this, it's always got red and black stripes. Almost looks like a monarch, a swallowtail, but not. They're smaller, but they'll get on a leaf, and they're very, like a colony will be there. All five or six or 10 caterpillars will be there. They'll work a leaf all together. Then they'll move to the next leaf. And all of a sudden, about a weekend, the leaves on your grapes look skeletonized. All the green flesh has been eaten off, and all that's left is the veiny parts of it. That's, that's great leaf skeletonizer. It's a caterpillar. BT is what you use. This is, will take care of all. I've always got a bottle of this in my garage just because when I see caterpillar, I'm gonna hit it. I actually just sprayed my tomatoes because I know tomato worms are coming. How many of you have had tomato worms already? You're seeing a few of them. They're starting this time for them to show up. Uh, you go out there and your tomato, which was beautiful. I'm trying to, I just don't know why I'm working over there. I'll, get it, I'll start over here and I'll slowly work my way over. Then we'll go line dancing later. Yeah, okay. I do like line dancing. Anyway. Uh, I always have some of this for my, my caterpillars, okay? Uh, for my, what I just sprayed in my yard, so if you like to entertain, we like entertaining. We've got big families, we like friends, groups getting over. We love backyard barbecues. Our entire yard has been set up to entertain. So hot tubs to built-in grills, huge patios, furniture, it's just comfortable. We love being back there. There's two things that, that destroy all parties outdoors. Mosquitoes and flies. If you get either one of those, the part, I mean one of them. And I have three daughters, one son. I'm like the only male, even the dog, I'm the only male. My son moved out, got married like five, seven years, seven, eight years ago, wow, a long time ago. So I'm the only male in the backyard. Man, if there's one thing that hits those gals, they are out of there inside the house going, that's it, we're out. So I really focused on, really, truly trying to keep the flies and the mosquitoes down. Uh, they seem to like, like Lisa. She loves, I don't know, if there's a mosquito within 100 yards, they find her. They just go after her. I'll be out there, I'm so tough and crusty, they don't bother me. But they do her. Um, so the day before the party, I'll go out and I'll spray multi-purpose insect spray. This is your catch-all for anything that moves. Grasshoppers. Blister beetles. I mean, I always have a bottle of this and my hose and spray in the yard, in, in the garage. Always. I have this always. Uh, it'll last for about maybe two years. The yard, after chemicals are on the shelf, I don't care if they're organic or chemical, uh, once they sit on the shelf for a couple of years, they coagulate, they just start to solidify and they, they settle. You can't mix them, they're not worth using. They lose their effectiveness. So if it's been on the shelf for like over two years, just throw the thing away. It's no good. You're going to put it into your hose and sprayer and it's just going to clog everything up. It gets in that filter and just, just clogs it up. It's more, it's more trouble than it's worth. And then you'll find it doesn't work. You've got to go back and do it again. Use, use things, buy enough, buy a smaller quantity and have it on the shelf for a couple of, enough to use up like this season. Okay. Multipurpose insect spray. This is permethrin. Um, we need something stronger. There's no organic, so it'll catch everything. And so I made this one. It, it's uh, this is a replica of, of an organic molecule. So it's if you crush up chrysanthemums, that's per pyrethrum. And then if you make the same thing in a lab, it's permethrin. This is the same exact thing. So it vaporizes off pretty quick in the sun. So you can spray it up to just a few days prior to harvest. But it is not truly organic. It's just a representative of, a, of an organic. It makes sense. This is as strong as we get over the counter here. So we're organic gardeners. I'll go organic whenever possible. But sometimes you just gotta break out the big guns going, dang, these things are bad. And I'm tired of them eating my, I have a, my nemesis right now is a, is a rabbit, eating my cucumber. They focus one baby rabbit, but it's a baby. You can't just kill it. And I'm an outdoorsman, I mean, I, I like watching the life drain out of game. I don't know, but I can't, it's so cute. He's got my dog over. He's going, yeah, well, yeah, that's good. It's in the front yard. 
and it just keeps eating on it. What's happened, I've encouraged the cucumber to grow into my yucca, which is more spiky, it's like a Spanish broom. And so they've eaten everything else except for the stuff that's in the, growing inside this. I'm using natural shrubs to grow cucumbers. It's crazy. Anyway, it's fun to grow. I like gardening. This is what I spray for, for grass, for uh, uh, leaf hoppers on my roses. There's a cute little bug about that big. Looks like a leaf, real big, real big body, thin, big body. That's a leaf hopper. Um, you do not want leaf hoppers in your yard. They really don't do a lot of damage. They'll eat some foliage. What they do is they spread disease like you've never seen. Because they fly around the neighborhood and they'll eat on this, this tree and then over here, then over here. They're the ones that click at night. You'll hear something kind of at dusk. You see this clicking in the, in the trees and the shrubs. Those are leaf hoppers, pretty big ones. And they spread disease. Um, so I try to spray them just so they don't spread powdery mildew, leaf spot, leaf curl, shot hole. There's all these leaf diseases that grow in, in your trees and shrubs typically uh, that I don't want to I don't want to have to wrestle with. And so I'll just spray the trees while I got my hose and sprayer. What I'll do is, is you bring one of those up for me? Maybe no. So I've got this fancy tool. It's a it's a hose and sprayer that connects to my hose. It's like a it's like a water nozzle that you'd you'd hose your your wash your car with. It's that only it's got a bottle on the bottom. You pour this in full strength. This is two tablespoons and a gallon of water. So this will make 16 gallons. And so I just pour it in, put it at two, it's got a dial at the top. It automatically mixes at the right ratio and water pressure. And so I go out and just spray everything down. I'm focused in for mosquitoes and flies specifically. I'm really focused in on the shrubs because they'll hang out inside those shrubs because it's cool, it's humid, and it's shaded. That's where mosquitoes hang out. Then during the evening, they come out, they eat. They eat my wife, so at least they just eat her. So uh, flies, they like to hang out underneath the shade of trees. Their flies are just like you and I. If you're comfortable, that's where you want to focus. So for me, they're, they're underneath my juniper tree. I got this magnificent uh, juniper tree. I pruned it up so it's shaded, and they just you can see them just flying around there. I'm like, okay, boys, just keep hanging out right there because I'm coming after you. And I just hose down that area and they get, and they, it gets rid of the most of the flies and mosquitoes. Yes? What about those little tiny white spiders? Spider mites? No, not, not spider mites. They webbed all over. Oh, actual spiders. Little tiny white spiders. Yeah, cool. So, so don't go to his house. He's got albino spiders. They come out at night and glow. <laughs> uh, spiders are generally good. So spiders, if you're in your own area, I leave you alone. If you come into the house, I'm coming after you. Because they're kind of spooky. Come on, eight eyes. Somebody's got eight eyes. That's not right. And so, but they're, they're in the gardens. Like you know, when the, my kids were younger, they got those crab spiders. It gets like this big and forms a web, this beautiful web. They'll build things underneath the eaves or in the bot underneath the steps, decks and stuff. We would actually feed those. <laughs> Catch a bug. I can't. Look at that. Watch that. Thunk. Thunk. Watch it go after them. And we'd name them. We'd have pets. Kind of, kind of, they're good. They're good guys. They catch all the bad bugs. Too many of them, though, they create a mess. They're bad. This will take off spiders like nothing else. So up in the corners of, of my deck, uh, there's no plants. I just spray this while I got it. It's right, it gets rid of this because they create a mess. They just create a mess. So this will wipe out spiders. Anything you touch, if you hit it, it will die. Be careful with this. You don't want to spray it on yourself. Although this is what they dip dogs, uh, dogs and horses in for ticks. So you could get some of it on you, but I just, I don't know. I just don't want it on me. I just don't want that. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of watch. I'll keep the dogs out of the area until it's dry which right now is about five minutes. Yeah. It just dries so fast. Uh, so I'll just keep them out of that area or keep them inside until I'm done. And then that's gonna, that's my go-to. And I've never had an incident or had issues, that kind of stuff. It is rated for vegetables, that kind of thing. Okay, grasshoppers. Grasshoppers, grasshoppers will obliterate them. I mean, if you hit them. Where are you spraying? 
I'm spraying in my hose and sprayer. They were in the, um, uh, they were on the roses. They were in the, they were in the uh, um, brown cover roses mainly. They could, there were some up in the big Cecil Bruner roses. Time lawns, they were in that quantity. It's not about quality. You just want to hose things down until it's dripping, dripping wet, okay? Uh, this one we're having uh, issues with uh, apples and pears. They're starting to get worms in them. So you see this, this spot, this, uh, you can see a worm hole. It, it matured inside. I don't know how to clean this up so it's nice, but basically they eat the inside of the, the fruit and then they start exiting it out. And you see that the inside rotted and then you'll see this exit tunnel. Those are coddling moth. If you have apples and pears, you're gonna have some coddling moth. You need to be preventative on, it, on that. So if you want a clean, neat fruit, you need to be proactive. And so this will take out coddling moth as well. So anyway, I could go on and on about bugs. There's so many varieties, I actually like bugs. I like fertilizer, I like killing things like weeds and bugs, and I like fertilizer because make what kind of nutrients can you give a plant to really green it up, to make it bloom, to really bring the most out of it. So we make our own fertilizers, just because I like to do that. So I talk to farmers and I just talk to smart people with lab coats. And they go, yeah, this really worked. You should do this. Like, okay, we'll do that. Um, okay, where else are we at? Let me reset here. Let me share this one. I wish it was, I just picked this like 20 minutes ago. We've got two kinds of weeds here. This is the most insidious weed you've ever seen. It spreads out like this. Let me see if I can get the folks online. Uh, this is goat head. It's got a yellow flower. It had a yellow flower just like that, it's right there. But you'll see these head, seed heads right here. You'll see a seed head like this that's got a burr on it. And when your dogs walk across and they just start limping, uh, this, is, this is really bad. Um, and it's showing up right now. If this was not in my gardens a week ago, it is right now. And they're small. This thing's about this big around, it will turn into this. And the entire underneath side of the, of the leaves will be covered in these burrs, the seed head. This is the easiest weed in the world to deal with. It's an annual. It only comes back by this seed. If you keep this plant from growing, this, this seed, it won't, it, you can just get ahead of it. Uh, right now, I'm taking a hoe to it. I'll probably go to that area. Just to, I don't have that many. I'll go through and looking for these. I'll go hunt them down because they're so bad. And I'll just take a hoe to it because it's got one tap root, and then, then the whole plant is dead. Um, you could spray this with just about anything. It will kill this off. The main thing I use for this, if I keep this seed from germinating, it won't form a weed. So what I did, I was hoping for more rain actually. I had, I put this stuff down, oh, a month and a half ago, like July 4th. I put it down because I thought, oh, the rains are coming. We've got one rain since then. And so this is a weed preventer. I spread it over my rock, around my gardens, in between my roses. Uh, it, and it, it doesn't kill weeds. It kills seed, so it keeps the seed from germinating. It keeps the taproot from going down and establishing. And so if you keep that seed from going down, this is foxtail, whorehound, goat head, all the things that have this cute name that seem innocent, that take over and like want to do injury to you, um, it, it affects all of those. And most of our weeds are tumbleweeds. That's an annual. It only comes back by the seed. If you can keep the seed from germinating, you won't have tumbleweeds at least in that part of the garden. So I use this stuff twice a year. I use it in January for the cool season weeds, uh, dandelions, uh, a foxtail, the two most insidious in early spring. And I'll use it usually right before the rains come. It's still sitting there. It's still waiting to go. I just need to rain activate it some more. Um, I'll use it right before the rains come in July, typically. So I, use, I don't have weeds. I have very, very few weeds in my, in my gardens. I hate, I despise weeding, and I dislike watering. So man was allowed to create computers to, to run irrigation, I'm convinced. That's why we have them. 
I wish I had a supercomputer to run my, I actually do have a supercomputer running my irrigation. It's pretty sophisticated. Satellites, data feeds, all online. I can run it from my phone. It's pretty wild. Um, but they, that's computers run irrigation. So I've got eight valves that run all my backyard, front yard. Every little micro, it's everywhere. Uh, and then I've got weed preventers to keep me from weeding. And that really does cut down on labor. Um, what other kinds of bugs? Let me check my spider mites, blood worm. What kind of bugs are you seeing out in the yard? Squash bugs. Vegetables, if you see things in vegetables, so squash bugs, if you see little beetles, this, this stuff, the, the multi-purpose will wipe out beetles and stuff. Uh, you'll get on cucumbers. There's a real cute spotted one that gets on cucumbers. Uh, if you see beetles in the yard, not good. Get rid of them. Uh, aphids will start showing up and white flies. Those are the two that seem to be late summer. You'll touch a plant and white flies start to, this like dust, white dust starts to float up. That's white fly. We really don't have that big an issue with that up here because it shows up so late in the season. They really come from the deserts. Down the deserts, they can obliterate entire fields of cotton, entire crops. Up here, they'll tend to focus on certain things in your yard, like they like my squash, it seems like. When I see it, I'll spray with a multi-purpose. Um, there's two things that I always have in my gardens. I have these two things in my shelf. I always have these two. These are my two go-tos. Triple action is neem oil, N-E-E-M. You organic gardeners, you know what that is, like the most famous organic spray there is. This worked really great on small bugs, aphids, thrip, flea beetles, little things, white fly, it worked very well, and completely organic. You could spray your cucumbers, harvest it in the morning, go harvest them that afternoon, wash it off and eat it, right? Just like that, and be completely organic. But it doesn't work on big stuff. It's not very effective on infestations. So blister beetles, spider mites, grasshoppers, ah, it's not my go-to, this is my go-to. So I'll just break out the big guns. So I always have these two things. With that, let's cover the pine trees. Right now I'm actually worried about pines, uh, especially the native pines. Uh, last time I saw this dry, it was about 10, 15 years ago, an entire tract of the forest died off because of blister beetle, not blister beetle, uh, uh, bark beetle or ips beetle. Flathead borers or several tip borers or several different insects that burrow through the bark and eat the plant from the inside out. Uh, if we don't get rain, this is going to be a serious problem. Um, I'm hoping for rain. But let's just hope for that. But we haven't seen it yet, so just be, I would say if you've got some of you have you bought that lot because of the majestic pinion pine that was sitting there, just it's just beautiful. Some of you built your decks around the ponderosas. I mean, if you lose these trees, the value of your home plummets. It changes the entire dynamics of your property. So some of these uh, specimen trees, you really want to care for them and take care of them. If you've got brand new trees, you really want to care for them just so they get rooted and established. You don't, because they're kind of targets. They're a little stressed out and want to watch after them. Um, so two things I'm doing right now with my pines Anything that's evergreen, especially the native stuff, uh, especially conifers, things with a needle, I'm really caring for mine. Uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm, I've, in fact, I just treated uh, with plant protector. This is a systemic bug killer. Systemic means that it's absorbed through the, through the foliage, through the plant, and now it permeates from the inside out, this plant. So I created this one, it's called plant protector for really the pine trees, pinion pines for scale, and ponderosa pines, scotch pines, ostrich, the pines for the bark beetle. Bark beetle is the one that, that uh, goes after pine trees. If you're walking in the forest and you look at a ponderosa and you look at the bark, you look closely at the bark, you see a pinhole in the bark, that's bark beetle. That's the exit tunnel of this cute little bug, it's tiny, eighth inch, tiny little thing but they attack pines by the thousands. Yeah, they do cedar, they can do any kind of evergreen, yeah. They, they kind of focus on the, their, their natural or native food is ponderosas, and they migrate over, I've actually seen them on spruce trees before. I've seen where it gets that bad. So just, I'm telling my friends, 
I mean, obviously you're supporting us. You came to a garden class. Thank you for that. Uh, some of you have, know my name. You just shop here so often. Thank you. You tell your friends what you're doing yourself and what, what you've seen before. Because gardening is about working with the environment, not working against it. And I, I've seen this pattern before where uh, all the only pine trees that were left were those that were cared for. I mean, entire streets were obliterated. Not one pinion pine left. Not one ponderosa left. Except for the ones that were planted next to a flower bed or a lawn, where you could tell folk gardeners were actually caring for their yard. Those are the ones that lived. If I had a big majestic pine tree, I would put this on it and I'd fertilize it with the all-purpose plant food. That's just the all-purpose. Did I get some of that? I would put some of this on, just to keep it healthy. That's all I would do. Okay. So I would fertilize everything in the yard right now. Just it's time. And then I pray for rain. If you do this, it will rain. It will come. It has to. Uh, but plants are starving right now. You're seeing your neighborhoods. You'll walk the neighborhood. You're seeing yellow. You go, wow, it's, it's, it's fall early. What's going on? That shouldn't, be, that shouldn't be turning red or yellow yet. It's way too, way too early. You're four, six weeks. You're almost two months too early for most of these plants. That's a stressed out plant. And what happens is you're fertilizing the spring. That's great. Good. We all do that. But then you've been watering like crazy. It's had all this new growth. And now we get into summer. And all that nutrients that you put onto your gardens back then, that's all flushed out. And now the plant is left wanting. It's left starving. Literally, it's starving. And so it will show up in yellow leaves. They'll stop blooming. Leaves will start dropping. They'll get so smaller. If you can fertilize and get some rain, instantly you get a whole another growing season out of things. All, all new set of foliage. Uh, whole, all new set of flowers on roses. You can get you can, it's another growing season now through September, middle, middle of October. There was a question right back there. Yes. So if you have a big ponderosa pine, you spray as much of the trunk as you can. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't tell you how to use it. I just told you what to use. Okay, good question. Got it. This is a systemic. This I'll take my watering can or five gallon bucket or something. You don't actually spray the, the, the foliage at all. You put it right at the crown, right where the trunk meets the soil. That's called the crown. You put it right there. And the plant will actually absorb it and take it up the trunk. And it travels about a foot a day, goes up the tree. So it might, you've got problems up there. It might take a week or two to get up there, but it slowly goes up there. And then this is a one application and you're set for the year. So you don't need to do go crazy with it. And then I'm not a big one. I mean, I sell cases of this to some people. When money's no object, do that. But for me, I, don't, I get my time's more valuable. If you've got a whole bunch of pine trees, you're in the forest, I would focus on the old guys. Some are just more valuable than others. And it seems like the bigger, more majestic older ones, they're more exposed. They're more, they seem to be the ones that collapse. The younger, smaller, more vibrant ones, they just, they're like teenagers. They're just growing. Nothing takes them down. They just keep going. I wouldn't focus on those. I'd go for the big boys or the one that's really valuable to you. Um, I did just do this on my maple tree. Uh, out front, I've got an autoblaze maple. It shades the, uh, that part of the yard and the driveway. Uh, my daughters park in the driveway. And it's little, I noticed a few spots on there. I went, okay, aphids are starting. They just started. Just a few spots, but I know what to look for. So I went, okay, I'm going to treat that. Because this is a big maple tree. I mean, we're talking fully mature, 35 feet tall. I can't spray that. I don't want to spray that far. So I uh, just put this on it, and that'll be my long-term solution to my aphid issues. Mulberries on that, yeah, especially fruitless mulberries. Yeah. Plant protector. Plant protector. And you only find this is for you folks. You'll only find this at Waters Garden Center. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> Bugs in the back, yes. Yeah, just a, a question. Um, uh, to your point about how dry everything is right now, seeing a lot of pine trees and all kinds of trees that are either snapping or yep. just, you know, dying otherwise. Uh, something that we have a lot of just kind of naturally around in the universe, you know, the big, kind of big blue junipers. I'm just wondering if there's anything we need to be doing practically to save those. So good. So if I, if I heard you correctly, uh, junipers, do I need to worry about those? What should I do to keep them healthy? What I'm doing right now for my gardens, 
uh, I've got drip systems, and drip system can cover water. I've got a whole class of just irrigation and watering. I don't want to go too deep on this. Uh, but what I'm doing myself, I, my systems are set up to water, I think every six, six or seven days right now, trees and shrubs. So I bumped it up, usually I'm every 10 days or so, but I bumped it up because it's so, so dry. Uh, I'm at every six, I think. Big, big uh, maples, uh, uh, grapes, uh, big shrubs, shrubs, that kind of stuff. Your drip system is just life support. It is not meant to keep your plants alive. It's just helped, it helps them get through the gap. What keeps your landscape alive? Mother nature and rain. We need the monsoon rains and we need those late winter snows. We need those. That's when all of our rain comes. It hydrates and plumps up that soil. The drip system just keeps you going. So what I'm doing is, because I've been doing some gardening this week, the ground is really, really dry. And so I'm hydrating before that soil, before I plant in it. That's obvious stuff. I taught that last week. Um, but then I'm taking, I'm, I'm hand watering, supplementing sections of my garden. So my strawberry garden was just, oh, it was so painful to look at them. They were, they were alive, but just whining. Of course, strawberries are big crybabies anyway, kind of like tomatoes. They're just all talkative. But they let you know when that part of the gardens are dry. So I just dragged my hose down. I put on little, little cheesy little metal sprays. I just put one of those on, put it down there, and ran it for like 30 minutes. And hydrated that entire section of the yard. I just did two more gardens. I've got stair step gardens down because we're on a very steep hill. So just went, oh, underneath my mimosa tree, this is a shade garden, but it's beautiful right now. I don't want to lose that because they got dry. And if mimosas, if trees get too dry, they'll start to shed leaves. You can just tell they're dry. They, they, they just start going, I can't keep up with per perspiration. I'll just defoliate. And to, to reduce the amount of water, I have to transpire from the roots. It's a natural defensive thing. So if your trees are losing some foliage, you mentioned snapping, drying, that's undry. I would just take a hand watering thing and just put a, uh, just put a sprinkler, it's like $5.99 or something, right? On the end of the hose, cheesy, shoop, let it run for a bit. Um, and I would just rehydrate probably once a month. I don't do this very often. I'm, I'm nervous telling folks to water more because most of you over water. Some of you are not gardeners. Your hobby is watering <laughs> and it's overkill. So don't go crazy with, especially with trees, because you can kill them by overwatering. But just to supplement, to keep it going until the rains come, I think that's fair. That's okay. So I'll water my gardens by hand, May and June. I'll water everything a deep soak like that once in those months. Even the native, even the juniper native stuff keeps them healthy, keeps the bugs off. Uh, I've done it in July. And I just, I'm just starting in August right now because until I see rains, I'm going to water once a month my established gardens. Now, of course, vegetables, flowers, containers, you're, I'm watering those every day. It's hot and dry. But my trees and shrubs, things that have been in for a while, I'm not doing that every day. That's way overkill. That'll kill them. That'll, make, that'll create real shallow roots. And that includes especially my natives because I'm really worried about my natives right now, native evergreens, because what happens is when a plant becomes stressed, especially a conifer, there's a creosote or type of scent that it throws off. You and I can't smell it, uh, but bugs can. And they're very social. So once a, a pine tree starts to get stressed, it throws off this scent. And so a bark beetle comes in and goes, oh, easy prey. Won't have any problem eating this one. Then, boom. It'll go through the bark and start eating the the cambium on that living bark underneath the main bark, start eating that, it'll girdle the tree. Well, once that starts happening, the tree starts to smell, send off even more stress signals. And now all of a sudden, the entire forest is honed in on this one tree. So out of, out of 100 trees, they don't hit them all. They hit the ones that are stressed. They focus in on that. That's why you'll see certain trees collapse in the forest. That's because they, that's how that happens. They're focusing on that. And it can happen in your yard as well, especially in your neighborhood. That's why you'll see, uh, when you see obliteration, like whole crops go down, 
a whole uh, monocultures, all, all the pinion pines or ponderosas or whatever that variety is, when they start collapsing, you'll see one or two that are just healthy as can be. That's because those were not stressed, they were cared for. The gardener, you can make a difference in your yard. You can make, have a healthier landscape. We're made, we're put on earth, I think, to take care of the planet, but especially your backyard. Yeah? We live in town and we have all kinds of, it's a black beetle, totally black, and they can be um, almost two inches off. I wonder how big this is. Are they dangerous? So, she's got a black beetle that's like monstrous. Yes. It wants to suck in your jugular vein mm -hmm. at night. Is that they, did I yes. explain that one right? Yes, yeah, big boy. There's a lot of beetles. Uh, we've got a June beetle, real fluorescent one. It's got green stripes. You've got some with polka dots. You've got some with horns. You've got lots of beetles. They all, every one of them came from a grub underground. Once they come up, they, most of them don't even have a mouth part. Most beetles don't bite. They don't bark. They don't do anything. They just come up for one thing. Find a gal lay eggs, reproduce, start over, and they'll live in the ground for two to five years. Most, depends on what, what variety. We can have dozens of varieties. I'm always awestruck with new varieties. I thought I'd seen everything, you're like, wow, I've never seen one of those before, neat, wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, but they all come from the same spot. Are they so dangerous? You, no. So They're, when you see them, should you kill them? Yeah, if they bother you. It sounds like yours, you need a shotgun or something, so they're pretty big. <laughs> they, well, okay. Here's how you prevent them. Um, I do have a certain area in my gardens that I have grub issues. They come all the time. Every year I get grubs in this part of the garden. It's moist, it's underneath my big junipers, it's shaded, and they just come in, they lay eggs at night, you'll see them hovering beetles, the smaller ones, hovering, they're just mating, doing their thing, they're laying eggs in this part of the gardens. So every spring, I know I'm going to have grubs, every spring I put a grub killer down in that part of the gardens. So when I see, if I were to dig a new tree or shrub, I would put a, I would treat that part of the garden, not that hole, that entire section of the yard, I would treat with grub killer. Use it to spray like a fertilizer, we have got it down on the shelf, I don't think I have it up here. I didn't come to do grubs specifically. I should have known it's summer, beetles are out. I should have known, but um, there's a grub killer. You sprinkle it on, water it in, goes to the soil, kills the grubs. Kill the grubs, you don't have any more beetles. They can fly in from other areas, but really it keeps, you gotta worry about them eating the roots on your plants, okay? Yes? Ants, gotcha, ants are easy. Okay, there's two kind, kinds of organics that bring ant stuff. Yeah, here we go. I've got another one. I've only got one. Okay, so there's two kinds of ants you got to worry about here. We've got three, really. Ah, there's more than that, but two main ones. Uh, the red ant hills, the fire ants, are not true fire ants like Texas, but they create these big mounds and they'll kill out, you know, entire areas would be no foliage. If you're out there, I'm okay with you living. But they bite grandkids, they bite dogs. I don't want them, I don't want them next to the house, okay? So I'm, I'm into living with, communing with my gardens, but there's a line, you cross it, it's over. Uh, it's called come and get it. Uh, red ants are very difficult to kill because the queen is so deep underneath the ground. You have to trick them into picking up a bait taking it down and feeding it directly to her. If you do that, the whole hill is dead within days. So come and get it is a completely organic bait that you can sprinkle onto red ant hills. It's very specific, it only works on that kind of ant. But we have a lot of those kind of ants. And so you sprinkle that around, you'll instantly you'll see the ants go, oh, bonus, I'm gonna take this down, I'm gonna feed it to the queen, and they're gone within a week. They don't kill, they don't die instantly. Uh, but if you try to, I've heard all kinds of great diesel fuel, I mean all kinds of crazy stuff to kill all these, you can't kill them because she's so deep. You can feed her this stuff and it takes them right out. This is one I use for, uh, they called piss ants, little tiny, tiny ants that come into the kitchen and they go in the cabinets and that kind of stuff. This is boric acid, only they've laced it, which is an organic, they've laced it with uh, some sort of sweet thing. They just cannot resist. They love this stuff the best little tiny ant killer 
Some ants are attracted to sugars and some are attracted not to sugar. This, those in the cabinets, they're, they're sugar lovers. I'll take my business card, I'll just drop some of this onto the card, put it in the pantry and kills them. Uh, it, where they're living, they're living out in the gardens, underneath the rock someplace. If you come across a colony underneath the rock, you need to just spray them with any of these sprays I've mentioned. Anything will kill an ant. If you can get, they don't have a very deep, uh, uh, they don't have a deep nest. They're underneath the rock someplace or, or litter someplace. So it'd be pretty shallow. If you see them, go after them with a, with, a, with a spray. But if they're really a nuisance, you'll see lines of them. Just put them where the lines are. Or sometimes I'll drip them in the rocks. So I can't quite find them. I'll go drip this onto the rocks. It's a clear, clear bait. They'll come out after it, and it, it seems to keep them thin. But this is the time of year when you see ants really, I mean, they just spotted on radar Doppler uh, over Australia, I think. A cloud of ants. I mean, they tracked them. They're so thick. They were flying. Uh, in the as, as the uh, monsoons come, they'll be coming even worse because the rains will get them to repopulate. They'll, they'll kind of fly off and divide. Now you got two queens, one here, one there. They're kind of like bees in that respect. Good question. Okay, what else? And I think we're in. This is not bug related, but it is vegetable garden related. We're having a, a, quite a few folks coming in going, my, my plants are struggling. They're either not blooming, they're not fruiting right. I don't have the production that I thought I had last year. Help, what do I do? We're, seeing, we're, in, we're getting this quite a, from quite a few gardeners. Uh, first and foremost, here's what I do. It's usually a phosphorus problem. If you front load your gardens, really vegetable gardens, with a lot of nitrogen, you put a lot of manure in there, uh, what will happen is these plants will grow like crazy and they'll forget to bloom. You need to give them more phosphorus. That middle group, nitrogen, phosphorus, potash. This creates green growth. This is blooms and fruits. Potash is more uh, disease resistance, thickness of stem, sturdiness, staying upright in a windstorm. That's the last number. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, middle number. You need middle number. I created flower power for that. If you've got hanging baskets that just stop blooming, flower power. If you've got tomatoes that just will not produce fruit, flower power. If you've got uh, giant pumpkins and they just aren't giant enough, flower power. This is for fruits and, and, and blooms. If it's just not fruiting and blooming or fruiting, flower power. So water soluble, it's got a scoop in there, scoop per gallon. I go through and I just go, here, have some more flower power. And I'll do this a couple times a month. And I have, I'm the garden, I'm the home that you walk by, you go, whoa, <laughs> that's pretty cool. I like that. It's all because of this. It gets you more flowers, okay? It's not, if your tomatoes are not producing, this will, this will make them go. The other one that we've been run out of, this is this COVID stuff. We've been out of Blossom Set for two months since the spring we just got replenished i mean it took that long it's ridiculous what's going on with trucking manufacturing this whole this whole supply chain thing that's a real thing that you're hearing it's real but we just got some so what blossom set does it plants are growing so fast right now they focus they actually have hormones built within them that they go grow 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 they get this mindset just grow foliage 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 Forget about blooming, just grow. And so you spray this on, it's not a pollen, it doesn't pollinate the flowers. What you do is you spray the foliage on the plant and it forces the plant to slow down and breathe for a minute. It's like a long distance runner going, Here, here's a couple of Gatorade, why don't you take a moment? Then you can go back at it. It's the basic Gatorade for vegetable gardens. It'll cause flowers, and it causes fruits, not flowers, fruits to get larger and more of them. When you spray the foliage, most folks use this incorrectly. And so if you've got eggplants that just aren't, they aren't setting fruits yet, this, watermelons, they just aren't, they, the, the melons are only this big yet, give them this. So blossom set, uh, peppers, it just, especially the really hot ones, habaneros are really hot guys. They, they just aren't producing, give them this, it'll force them to start blossoming, okay? And then I'll give you this last thing so it's not all about bugs and technical. This is a new echinacea that just came in. 
Isn't that cute? Most echinaceas are, are yellow. Uh, they've got a dark, dark seed head with a yellow flower on it. That's the common one, orange, pinks. You ain't never seen this color before. Isn't that cool? I looked at that and went, nah, that's pretty, this is going home with me, by the way. This one's not for sale, this is sombrero well. echinacea. <laughs> but I've got more down there. So there's a whole crop. There's actually, I've probably got five new colors of echinaceas. This is a fun summer through fall plant. I'm also a bird gardener. What I do with this, because it's got a big seed head, and when, you, when this gets done blooming, like I'll let this stay on there for another day or two, I'll pinch that off, it will instantly set another flower. So it reproduces. This one benefits from pinching or deadheading. It's another name for it. Uh, what I'll do is I'll do that till about October. In October, I let them all just keep seeding. And I let, let them keep those seed heads through winter. And this is a food source for my birds that eat seeds. The smaller birds will go peck around looking for seed. I'll keep these on just so I, I attract more birds in my own gardens. Uh, so that, that's something new. This is the normal color. This is the one you've seen from your grandparents grew this one. I'm bored. Please give me something. That's the new one, Sombrero. This is fun. This is just a go-to. It's a pretty pink. Uh, what else? Something first, very first crop of pansies came in. Um, I, I don't think most the growers grow for Phoenix and Southern California at Palm Springs. They do not grow for us. The growers that grow for us, they're in Denver. So we're in this no man's land where no one wants to truck anything up here. So all the crops, you don't plant, you plant this in Phoenix right now, it's dead within a day. It just does not like heat. So I grow, we grow our own pansies. It's a new ruffled, I don't know, it's called frizzle sizzle pansy. Uh, I just saw it in the catalog, went, that's pretty cool. I want to grow that one in my gardens. So if I want to grow it, I know other gardeners do too, so we grew this one. So we can get it in just a little bit early. So if you plant this now, this will turn into this. And pansies will bloom right through winter. They are amazing. So if we wait until Phoenix finally needs pansies, it'll be like November. And yeah, they'll live, but they won't flush new, they won't become big and showy. So that's the first crop of that. Boring, boring, boring. Ah. First crop of mums came in, so fall's just starting. Fall, first of the fall crops. In another two weeks, it looks like they'll, they're nice and green, but they're not quite there yet. So by the end of this month, first part of September, fall, the fall crops will be here, which I just love the fall crops. It's decoration is what it is, yeah. Do the rabbits like the echinacea petals? Rabbits do not like echinacea. Because I got some Shasta daisies and the rabbits ate. Echinacea. They like Shasta daisy. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. They don't eat gallardias, echinaceas. They don't eat tickweed or, or uh, uh, coreopsis. Well, it depends on the rabbit. Most rabbits have read the list and they don't eat this. Some, I think it depends on the variety sometimes. So they generally will leave coreopsis alone. Um, what else? Do they have anything else they leave alone? Delete, 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 delete everything else. So they'll eat everything else. So kind of watch them. There's lists down there. If, the, if rabbits are your bane, we have a million in our neighborhood. do you? You need you need a good crock pot and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a BB gun. I just that's offensive to some people. Sorry. So anyway, that's what they do in the Midwest. I'll I'll uh, I will hang out. As a kid, I hunted squirrels and rabbits. Just they gave me a 22. Go here, son. Come back for dinner. It's kind of southern boy. It's kind of I just love the forest. Anyway, thanks for tuning in, you folks on uh, Facebook. Uh, take a look. We'll have YouTube up here in a few days. So as we get that edited down. Before you leave, I'll just hang out here, answer questions. We'll put our masks on. We'll kind of kind of do the social thing, and then I'll just let you clap because I just like that.